Well, in a very structured way. You've got to understand that this is not going to be an effort that's going to culminate with taking the hill, planting the flag, and going home to a victory parade. Rather, it's going to be uh, a set of small successes and perhaps small setbacks along the way, certainly. Uh, it will be the gradual accumulation, the gradual achievement of progress that does then start to accumulate over time. And you can map it, you can see it, you can feel it. Uh, you'll see it in the metrics. We work very hard to have a whole series of different metrics on which we focused, whether it was daily attacks initiated by the enemy, uh, suicide car bombs, regular car bombs, uh, um, improvised explosive device explosions, um, sectarian violence, um, our casualties, Iraqi casualties, uh, civilian casualty, again, across the board, even into how many megawatts of electricity are being produced, how many barrels of oil produced and exported. Every element of uh, Iraq, its society, its political uh, progress, its social uh, progress, basic service provision, um, hospitals, schools, rule of law, you name it, we had to track all of that, in addition to the normal military measures, if you will. And we had, again, a very, very structured process. Every single day, we had the battlefield update and analysis. Uh, it started, I think it was at 7.30 in the morning till 8.30, uh, our time, uh, a full hour, at the end of which we had a small group meeting with a select group of the highest, uh, most senior coalition leaders, and then ultimately a smaller group with just U.S. and U.K. and perhaps the smallest of the small groups, which was Lieutenant General Odierno and, and me sitting there looking at each other, uh, asking when each of us thought this thing was gonna turn in the early, very, very tough days. Uh, but then we would have a series of other events during the week. There was a whole matrix, in fact, that we worked out over time, again, a living document, but one that got an hour each week a minimum with the three-star train and equip commander, another hour minimum with the special operations uh, commanders. Uh, there was a special intelligence uh, assessment that we did every Sunday uh, that used to be, frankly, very stimulating and enjoyable. Uh, we had marked out two days a week minimum where right after the battlefield update and analysis, I'd either get in, a, in an up-armored Humvee or a or one of the other vehicles or a helicopter and would drive or fly somewhere uh, and then go on a patrol with a unit. Uh, spend time with that unit, get an update from them, get their overview, get a feel for myself of what the situation was on the ground, meet with Iraqi leaders while I was out there. There were certain Iraqi events every single week. There was a National Security Council meeting of the Iraqis that was conducted uh, every single week. As an example, there were periodic other activities. There was the Baghdad Security Council uh, that we did uh, every week as well. And then, as I've mentioned, we had the video teleconference with the President of the United States, uh, Washington time, 7.30 on a Monday morning to 8.30. I had the video teleconference with Secretary Gates and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs every Tuesday, Washington time, 7.30, uh, and, and so forth like that. Then there were events that took place um, bi-weekly, there were monthly events, and there were even quarterly events, all the way up to the so-called strategic campaign plan uh, assessment that Ambassador Crocker and I conducted with all of the leaders uh, of the diplomatic, the U.S. and coalition diplomatic communities uh, and embassy teams uh, with the development and intelligence uh, leaders there as well and then obviously all of the senior coalition military leaders present also. And we worked through how were we doing. We had quite detailed uh, analytics that we looked at for how were we coming in the train and equip mission of the Iraqi security forces, uh, the overall security situation, uh, gradually areas that were assessed to be safe, uh, and, and so forth and so on, all the way through all the civilian lines of effort as well. Well, it's a wonderful question because you tend to think, well, the decisive point is at the point of decision, at the front lines. It's on the hill overlooking the Battle of 
Waterloo or whatever it may be. Uh, but that's not always the case, uh, in, particularly in a small unit endeavor uh, like a counterinsurgency operation. You may have a very large battle. Uh, you might have the Battle of Ramadi, for example, which unfolded over a month of clearing operations and so forth. You might have the Battle of Fallujah, uh, Bakuba, or various Baghdad neighborhoods, the Battle of Basra, a major uh, Iraqi initiative that almost went south. Um, and, you know, for the strategic leader, you may want to go out there, certainly, and see it for yourself. I was on the ground in the Battle of Ramadi, Bakuba, these others. You get up as close to the front as you, you can responsibly. You've got to walk patrols. But the truth is, for a strategic commander nowadays, you're probably more likely to find the decisive point, uh, if you will, uh, to be in a headquarters of all things, where you can actually see what the predators and unmanned aerial vehicles are seeing. You can, you can gather what is coming in in terms of communications and signals intelligence. Um, you can get all the other sources uh, of information from the battlefield. And keeping in mind that a strategic leader is not the individual who's ordering squads or battalions or even brigades around on that battlefield. Uh, he's an individual that is uh, setting in motion uh, an operation and then letting it unfold and obviously not only monitoring it but overseeing it uh, but recognizing that between him and that trooper on the ground with a rifle is a three two one star uh, colonels captains and all the rest of that uh, and so you have to figure out how to get that right where is the point that you should be uh, where is the the decisive point for a strategic commander uh, and don't think that it's always looking over the shoulder of the point man uh, of the lead element in an attack but recognize it's where you can bring in the information and where you also have the communications and other means uh, to direct the kinds of big shifts big decisions uh, to those who are the operational commanders the tactical commanders and those actually out uh, fighting their way through a city or a, or a tough spot. In the Battle of Basra, for example, uh, I went to see Prime Minister Maliki, and he asked me if I would support him. He said, I've just ordered two divisions south to Basra. We can't take this any longer. We must uh, deal with the situation there. And this is a considerable acceleration, to put it mildly, of what it was we were planning to do in a much more deliberate fashion. Uh, and I said, of course, I'll support you, Prime Minister. I'm your soldier as well as President Bush's and a uh, soldier of the other coalition leaders, but I'd like you to set conditions. I'd like you to get us a couple of days uh, in which we can reposition forces and baselines and communications and command posts and all the rest. Um, we didn't get that in the end. He agreed to that. He said, yes, that makes eminent sense. That's what we will do. Uh, but what happened is the Iraqi forces got sucked into a fight the minute they were on the outskirts of Basra, and we were into it. In that case, what was important was getting the operational commander uh, down there. And Lloyd Austin, Lieutenant General at, the, at that time, subsequently General Odierno's replacement as a multinational force Iraq commander and now the commander of U.S. Central Command, uh, he went down and he assessed the situation. And without asking permission, uh, and he shouldn't have, uh, he directed his core tactical command post to deploy to Basra to augment the British-based multinational division headquarters for Southeast so that it could, it could integrate all of the uh, U.S. unique feeds uh, and oversee and control the different assets that we were repositioning from U.S. Uh, elements down there to support the Iraqis in that fight, even as we raced to get advisors with them, uh, raced to get joint tactical air controllers out on the ground and all the rest of that. Uh, so that, again, you can see how this plays out uh, and see how a strategic commander, uh, rather than being the individual as, as in the days of a Napoleonic or even more recent uh, combat operations, is whether he likes it or not, probably more likely to find the decisive point in a headquarters rather than that out on the ground watching a particular operation unfold. As much as he may want to do that and indeed should do that periodically just to have, ensure that he has an own, his own feel, his own sense of the situation, but recognizing that he's not out there directing 
battalions, brigades, divisions. That's going to be done by an operational level commander, perhaps at his direction. Uh, but he needs to be in a position to have a sense of that, and that's probably going to come back in a headquarters somewhere.